like, oh, you know, well, you're kind of upset about this, so I'll just buy you flowers and then that'll fix everything. You know, we try to do the quick fix of like, okay, let's, here's the fix all, here's the band-aid. Um, but it still doesn't work like that in relationships. Um, there are no quick fixes. And that's what this whole series is, is, is about, is about building a life that has longevity building relationships that have longevity. And so we have to change some of our mentalities in order to pro approach these things from a godly perspective in a godly way that puts God first in our relationships, that puts God first in our lives, that builds on a strong foundation, a firm foundation um, that he has for us. Um, you know, and, and with relationships, I think sometimes we can be tempted, you know, we wanna kind of see how things are. So, you know, it's just like when you plant flowers, you can't pull up the flowers and look at the roots and see how they're growing, right? <laughs> it's like with relationships, you can't uproot them and say, okay, let's see how it's growing. Like, you know, sometimes when you do that, you, you worsen the relationship altogether. But we have to trust that we're making these deposits. We're making these small changes. We're putting these deposits into our kids. We're putting these deposits into our husband, into our friends, into our families, into our parents, into our sisters, brothers. We're putting these deposits and we're being faithful with them. And we're, we're attempting to, to make more deposits than we make withdrawals and being intentional about that and we know that God's gonna do the rest you know what you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you it is in him that we live and move and have our being and as we set our minds on him we focus on him he's gonna put all those other things into place and so we we have to be intentional and be proactive we have to make that first step but it's all about being guided by the Holy Spirit being led by him and so that brings us to habit number four habit number four is think win-win think win-win you know, I'm going to be honest, when I think of this, um, actually, when I think of this, the song that comes to mind is probably not even a good song, but it's that song, all I do is win, win, win. <laughs> I'm like, that's probably not a good song, so I apologize. But um, I was like singing that today, this morning, and my dad's like, what is that? And I was like, oh, I'm doing a, you know, message on think, win, win. And he's like, well, I like what your message sounds like better than I like what that song sounds like. <laughs> it's like, okay, I'll keep that in mind. Um, so anyway. But when I, when I think about winning, you know, I, I'll be very honest. I'm a competitive person. Do we have any competitive people in the room? It's okay. Um, <laughs> and um, I'm a rule person, you know? Like, I'm like, you know, when, there, when there's a game that we're playing, I, I take games very seriously, you know? There are rules there for a reason. And, you know, the people who get on my nerves the most are the people who, they like, they bend the rules. They bend the rules, exactly. Like, we'll be playing a game, and you know, we're all each on our own team, but then this person starts helping this person. I'm like, what? You can't do that? That's, that's against the rules. Or I was playing Mafia one time, and y'all know Pastor Clay Baird? I think he's one of the most competitive people I have ever met. And we were playing Mafia, and he decided he wasn't in the Mafia. Do y'all know what I'm talking about? This probably sounds crazy if y'all are like, I don't know what that game is. That sounds like really weird, Liz. Um, but it's, it's kind of like a card game, but not really. You each have a role, and there's a couple people in the Mafia. Well, he decided he didn't get the Mafia card, but he was going to be in the Mafia. So he totally rigged the whole game and won because he cheated. But, you know. <laughs> Just to call him out. Sorry, Pastor Clay, I know you're not here to defend yourself. My bad. But there are four, four different ways that we can approach human interaction. Four different ways that we can approach human interaction. The first one is win-lose. And this is the competitive model. This is the competitive model. Win-lose. And I know some of you, you already have your blanks filled in in this workbook. We noticed after we were printed like half of them that for some reason this one week had the blanks filled in. And then we printed about half of them and then we're like, okay, well, we don't want to waste money, so we'll just keep going. So if you already have the blanks filled in, great. You can just focus on the message. If not, sorry, you got to write. Okay, so win-lose. This is the competitive model. I win, you lose. I win, you lose. You know, I babysat for a little boy one time. I won't name any names, call anyone out. But uh, I babysat for him, and he loved winning. Love, 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 love winning. Love winning so much that we, it was the similar type of thing. We were in the middle of a game, and you know what he did? Changed the rules in the middle of the game to make sure he won. Oh, you're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to do that. Oh, well, why not? Oh, well, this rule. You know, you're not allowed to do that. It's like, oh, okay. And then he did that. Well, I'm allowed to do that, but you're not allowed to do that. You know, and he was young. You all know how it is when you have little kids. They just love winning and they don't quite know the rules of interaction yet. And so he would keep changing the rules so that he would win. And, and, but how many of you know, sometimes we still do that as adults. We manipulate situations, don't we? We manipulate people. We say, oh, well, if I cry and, and show myself a certain way, then I'll get what I want. 
Or I know that I can manipulate this person. I'll come to this person and tell them my side of the story. So then that way, when this person approaches, they'll be on my side. And then that way, I'll get my way. So we have certain ways that we can still win. But you know what? A win for us is always a lose for someone else. And really, when it's a lose for someone else, that ultimately means it's a loss for us too in relationships. When we're making someone else lose, it is ultimately a lose for us as well. You know, we, we in, the comp- in the competitive model, you're motivated by a win or by a perceived win. It may not even be an actual competition. You just perceive a competition in your mind. Like, I know that I'm called to speak and I want to be a speaker, so when I see someone else do it and they do it really well and they get all these compliments, I'm going to be like, mm, I'm not going to support that. You know, you don't, you don't root for that person because you are jealous because you have a perceived competition that if they're doing really well in that, that means that I can't do really well in that, or that means that I'm not as good as they are. And so it becomes this competition or comparison model. And it it actually comes from the scarcity mentality where you believe that there are only so many pieces of the pie. You know, there's only eight slices, and if she gets a slice and she gets a slice, then there's only a few slices left, and I want to make sure that I get a slice. But how many of you know God doesn't work on the pie and the scarcity mentality? There are more than enough pieces of the pie. He's able to do exceedingly, abundantly above what we could ask or imagine. Amen. And so we have to trust that. We have to trust that. we. And you know what? Every time that there's a competitive model set up, it is, it is always against cooperation. You are not going to want to cooperate with the person who you're in competition against. You know, just like when you're out on a football game, you're not going to all of a sudden start running for the other direction for the other team to help them out. You know, you're not going to all of a sudden start cooperating with them. It's a competition. You're against each other. You're at odds with each other. And so when you set up a competitive mentality in your mind where you are at odds with each other, maybe you and your husband, maybe you and another girl, maybe, you know, you and your sister, you and your mom, we're at odds with each other. We're in competition. One of us wins. One of us loses. You set up this mentality. Okay. That's going to limit you working together. (laughs) That's going to automatically say, okay, we're we're probably not going to be cooperating because we're setting up this competitive model. That's like in the example he uses in the book, he talks about this company where he said, you know what? I'm having this really hard time getting my managers to work together. They just will not cooperate. They won't work together. He's like, okay, well, let me go in. Let me see what's going on. So he observes and he's like, you're right. Like they really aren't cooperating. They're really not working together. So then he stays with them throughout the day and he goes into their meeting and in the meeting he sees this board and everybody has a horse and there's a beautiful picture of Bermuda at the, end of the, at the end of the little horse race. And all the managers are in competition against each other to win this trip to Bermuda. So how many of you know when you set up a competitive model, it does not bring the fruit of cooperation? You know, when you set up a model where they're all competing against each other to win this wonderful trip to Bermuda, it's not going to encourage them to work together. They're gonna, not going to want to cooperate with one another. And so you have the model that you set up, the way that you're approaching human interaction will actually determine the outcome of that relationship. It will actually determine, are you going to work together or are you going to put yourself at odds against each other? Because that, you know, and I love, Cassie wrote a blog just um, a couple weeks ago or recently on, um, on carryweems.com, but about the narrow road and how the narrow road is really our narrow road. It's the road that God's called us to walk on. And so many times we look at someone else's narrow road and we say, well, look at, oh, that mom makes all her own baby food from scratch and she has an organic vegetable farm. And, you know, like, (laughs) no offense to those moms. I mean, we're all jealous of you, but, (laughs) but like, seriously, who has time for that? No, I'm just kidding. Um, But we look at that and we're like, I'm not doing that. I must be losing as a mom. She's winning. I'm losing. But you know what? You have your own narrow road that God has you on. And you know what? That narrow road is going to have its own set of challenges. And their narrow road is going to have its own set of challenges. But you can't judge your narrow road based on someone else's narrow road. It's your narrow road to walk. And so you've got to, you've got to make sure that you're lining up your narrow road with the Holy Spirit. You know, he has gone before us already. He has already prepared the way for each one of us. All we have to do is seek him and find that way that he has for us. 
And so don't look at it from a competitive mindset. Don't look at it as, oh, well, this girl's getting all the compliments, so that means she wins and I lose. So I must try to do something different so that I get all the compliments. And then that way I'll win and she'll lose. That's a competitive mentality. There are enough compliments for everyone to go around. There's enough compliments for all of us and more. And so it doesn't matter how many compliments someone else is getting, there's still enough for you. It's okay. And you know what? Even if no one else is complimenting you, get your compliments from God because God has them. Encourage yourself in the Lord because he has them. And so I just want to encourage you. Um, you know, just like in John chapter 21, verse 22, Jesus was talking about John. He was talking to um, Peter, I believe, because he was saying, Peter, basically he was telling Peter that you're going to die a martyr, martyr's death. He was pretty much alluding to that fact. And he said, well, what about John? You know, isn't that always like us? Like, I'm asking you to carry this. Well, what about her? <laughs> How come she doesn't have to carry that? How come I have to carry this? How come I have to be the loser and she gets to be the winner? You know, right? <laughs> Um, but he says, Jesus answered and said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. And that's what he calls each one of us to do. If I want that person to carry that, that's up to me. You follow me. It doesn't matter what that other person is doing. It doesn't matter what's going on. Let that go. You follow God. You follow what God has for you. You know, I love the verse that's listed there in the book for this, um, for this little section. It says, for all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. You know, I just encourage you, humble yourself and honor others. You know, don't make it a competition where there's a winner and a loser. Don't look at it that way. It doesn't have to be that way. Um, just honor others and humble yourself. And you know what? As you humble yourself and say, God, I'm going to humble myself to be on the journey you have me on. I'm not going to try to seek for things. I'm not going to be man-driven. I'm not going to be driven by what man's expectations are, but what other people may be doing or may not be doing. I'm going to be driven by you. I'm going to have a God focus. Um, and so I just encourage you in that um, to let go of that win-lose mentality. Let go of that comp competitive model that we've built up in our minds. Um, and honestly, that starts from a young age. You know, we, we give so much accolade to the child who earns straight A's, but what about the creative child that earns C's or B's? You know, there's some great people who have accomplished amazing things in their lives and they weren't straight A students, okay? And so, and not that we shouldn't value those things and not that we shouldn't encourage those things in our children, but we should encourage their strengths as well and not just harp on their weaknesses, not just harp on what they're not doing well and the competition, oh, well, your sister is doing this, but you're not. You know, or this, you know, your sister is really good at this, but you're not really good at this. Or why don't you be more like your sister? Or, you know, all those kinds of things that it creates that competition between them when really, no, let's cooperate together. Your sister is really good at being creative, so she can help you with your school project that needs creativity. Or, you know, your brother's really good at, at this area, so he can help you with that. And so looking at their strengths, not just setting a competition up against each other. So that's the first model, win-lose. The second model is lose-win. You know, this is the give-in model. I will lose so you can win. You know, this can actually sometimes be worse than win-lose because you have no standards, no demands, no expectations, and no vision. You know, you can take a very biblical principle, um, just like in the, in the book, Romans 12, 18. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. You can take that model and say, okay, I'm supposed to live at peace with everyone, so I should just give in. I should